believe we're on then. Okay. Uh, I think we're on. Yeah, I think so. All right, okay. If we're not on, well, then um, we're just talking to ourselves, and we are. We'll talk anyway. Okay, we'll work on the assumption there. there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a few things I wanted to talk about. I'll do the article first, because normally we always present our articles, and um, the problem we have this time is I've written an article about six rocks. Sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Have you read it yet, Evan? I've just put my seatbelt on. <laughs> yeah, no, um, that's the drawback with this. Now, Evan tells me when we do this, we shouldn't talk about the whole article because then people won't read it. Most people don't read it anyway, Evan. Yeah, well, yeah. I Look, I'll try to make a meme out of the rocks, but it's a bit hard sometimes. Rocks are hard to do memes on. Yeah, they're hard to do anything on. So what I'm going to do this time is, because I know that most people don't read the rocks, and to be honest, if someone told me I'll put up an article about six rocks, I wouldn't, wouldn't, probably wouldn't read it either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of take you through it a bit, the article itself, and then... You'll hear most of it now, and then if you want to read it, you can later, because you've already got the general idea. Okay, there are two batches that were sent to us by two ladies, and I'm going to change their names, because um, anyone that sends us rocks gets attacked by people countlessly, and I've written about that again in there, why they do that. And I'm going to make the point once again, we only accept rocks that don't come out of a stick, stone, bone technology, that come from a more sophisticated technology, when Australia was broken up into three cultural groups. And one was called Southern Law Confederation, and all the rocks we have come from that confederation. Or, we don't know where they come from. And most of them, we haven't any idea anyway. But irrespective of that, these ones, when they first turned up, um, I think to an extent we're spoiled. We've got so many rocks that look so dramatic and impressive in their uh, presentation, their visual presentation, uh, I get to the stage when I see other rocks, I sort of go, oh, yeah, what's there? Not much or very little. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through some of these rocks now and show you a couple of things about them that at first glance may not look that impressive. They certainly didn't for me when I first looked at them. In fact, that's what the article's called at first glance. And then I say that to begin with, when I saw these rocks, I thought, oh, yeah, okay, there's not much there. Turns out there's a lot more. And luckily, when I look at something, I look at it quite a few times, and I'm going to take you through some now. Now, what, from this first batch of three rocks I'm going to show you, uh, it's going to start with this one here. I'm going to hold it up. And if you look at it, you might see there is, first of all, there, a sort of a varnish that's on the rock. But further around, you've got a much thicker arrangement there. And it is also here. And it's much thicker. In fact, it's like a crust on top. And I'm going to show you another rock I brought along that is a lot more visually impressive, of course. And you'll see see that one there? It's got things that are placed on top. It's not cut in. And if I turn around to the next side, you'll find a different arrangement. You've got raised bits and things that are cut. And on that side, you've got these ridges that run across. You can see the ridges there. So this is not unusual to see raised pieces of... Um, uh, coat. What is unusual, and there's also a fairly good chance there's little splotches there of white ochre. What is very unusual is that you've got two different types of coating next to one another that are completely different in colouring, in thickness, in everything, and I've never seen that before. Now what's particularly interesting about this mile rock, which is held in this hand here, is the lady sent it to me and um, when she told me about the rocks, both these guys, ladies, when they told me about the rocks, I gave them the same rule I always do. Um, first of all, if you're going to send it away, check locally and find out if there's someone there that understands the rocks and doesn't want to put them in a canister, but give them ceremony and put them in the ground and wake them up. And if not, send it to us, because as you know, we're putting them in the ground and there are going to be people going to be sitting around them and that's what we're doing at the moment. You're probably aware, twice we've, we've nearly had them ready to go into country, on Ramanjeri country. After we agreed with the Ramanjeri and Kano, we're going to do that, and they've taken away. And what we're doing at the moment is we're putting them on our country, and we're on to our third attempt to put them on country in Ramanjeri area. So, this rock here, I told her to get rid of it. The reason being, this rock stayed at this lady's mother's bedside table. And after a while, she started to bleed through the nose. 
And we know what that means. It means the rock is attacking the person who's next to it because they don't want them there. And we know where that ends up. Anyway, she, this, this lady went to all the doctors and they did all a battery of tests and came up with nothing. She said, there's nothing wrong. They said, it'll just go away. Well, it did, because soon after she died and she kept bleeding through the nose and the bleeding got worse and worse and worse. It's a male rock. We've had another rock that did the same thing. I've mentioned that before. This is a common story. If you've got a rock that when you start bleeding through the nose, it means get rid of it. And like I said, if it's got technology that is obviously stick, stone and bone, find the elder. We don't want it. We don't take those rocks. Anything that belongs to the stick, stone and bone culture, which started about 12,000 years ago, we think, it's not our concern, it's not our business. And they belong to country. Those rocks from that point on belong to a specific place. Before, like Ross's Rock 1 was found in Darkingon country, which is sandstone. It is not sandstone. The second rock was found in basalt country, and it's not basalt. These things travel. They travel all over that area. But the ones that don't travel, that are made recently, we don't want. And when we do get some like that, we have had a few, and we've given them back every time. Maury, Uluru. We've done it quite a few times. Well, places where it was outside the area and it was obviously not stick, uh, it was stick, stone and bone technology. Either of those two things were given back. Okay, this one we took. I told her, since there are only women in the house, to bury the thing with gloves and then when you decide to send it to us or the elder, then you take it out with gloves, post it and get rid of it. Well, she did. She sent that one, which is interesting for that reason. Then next to that, was another rock which threw me a bit to begin with it's this one here and you may see when I hold it up it's going to be hard to get that right you'll see a couple of straight lines lines running over this really rough surface and you can see that tinge of brown which we think is ochre and on this side here you'll see there's two sections that have been flattened and actually flattened and then coated but what's interesting is this when you take this rock and I rest it there like this Oops, sorry, I'll make sure I don't drop it. It sits. It sits on that bit there. But the interesting part is, look how it sits. It sits on a lean. That's not flat. That's actually on an angle, that cut. This is actually being cut, so it stands up. This one takes the weight, but not well enough. It falls over. But on that side, it's weight-bearing, but weight-bearing not at 90 degrees, not cut straight, but cut at an angle that when you put it like that, you'll see it actually is not a straight cut, but it's balanced. So it's actually a rock. And some of those straight lines I'm holding up there go down the other side and run up this side here. And the lines are perfectly straight. You might just see a vestige of one there. And there's a second one that runs down there. And they're very fine cuts. But what's fascinating is, ladies and gentlemen, here's one of the other rocks we've got at the moment. You see that one there? It's got lots of straight lines also. But it's on a flat coat. It's on a flat coat. That's got hundreds of cuts that are straight. We do straight lines. This is Straight lines are obviously old way. And you can't make these rocks by stick, stone and bone and cut them like this anyway. This one, what's fascinating, when you look at sideways, you'll see it's got all these ridges and it's really rough. But they've managed to go down the ridges and still keep the kink, the line, the alignment straight. There's no kinks. So that is obviously something that's a made to stand up it's not a holding rock and it's got all these straight lines on probably the roughest coat we've ever got for straight lines and we don't we have a couple of standing rocks but they stand straight up they don't stand on an angle like that so those two rocks and to begin with they, well, i saw the rock when i first saw this one i saw that side and when i first saw this one i saw the side that doesn't have many marks and i thought well yeah so what i didn't really look at that to begin with and you can see it's been coated and then it stands up on an angle. So that turned out to be quite an interesting rock, which I didn't see. This one, I didn't see this side. So those two rocks are part of this article, what we've written about. Um, the third one there is this one here, which is quite interesting. Because if you look at it, you'll find it's actually got a blade on the top. Now that blade has got two kinks there. I think they're impact points where it's been dropped some, somewhere. You'll see them there. But mainly... And there is also a percussion point there, that one there. And when you put your thumb on it like that, it shows you it's a left, a right-hand hold. But it's not an axe. 
It's too small to be an axe. There's no hafting point there. And more importantly, when you hold it up, there's no usage on that. Now, it's obviously artificial. We've got another one, which is five kilos, which I haven't brought in at the moment because it's a killing rock at the moment. It's on guard duty. And that particular rock, that rock is interesting because of one thing. That rock has got exactly the same blade, only much bigger. And it hasn't got an impact point on it. And that rock is used for basically protection and killing. So what that rock is, we're not sure, but we know it's not used as an axe. But because it's got a position there for the thumb to sit in, which is a right hand hold, it's a holding rock. And so is the other one. Now the other one's obviously much bigger, but it's possible this has got something to do with fighting or killing again. So we're not sure on that one. Okay. <clears throat> that was the first group. We also already had another group from another lady who sent some stuff to us. And I'm going to hold up a few of those because one of these in particular I did like to begin with, which is this one here. Now, I'm going to see if I can hold it the right way, which is that way. And you might see there's a line of dots. Now, when you get closer, and you'll start to see it now, you can see them a bit more. There are seven dots that run in a perfectly straight line. And you'll see a beginning dot at the top. There's five that run down and they join up at the point there and they make a 45 degree angle. And that was quite interesting because A, seven along there, and some of the dots on the top one there go into the coat, but they don't hit the base underneath. You can see the base underneath it. Some of the lines running up on the diagonal, two of them just are in prints, and you can't see them right now, on the coat. But what that is, what was interesting is the coat itself. It's the thickest coat we've seen. Normally the coats are half a mil to a mil. This is about two and a bit. It is a really thick coat. You've got on the back there those three lines, and they go down a deep, fair way. It's also the most lustrous coat because you can see it's actually shining now off a light that's pointing off in a different direction. It's not even shining at me. It's still picking up the light source. Not natural, obviously, and it's got this um, little cut on the bottom that goes around a little ridge there. And it I was attracted to for two reasons because inside that area there you'll see it's slightly redder because there's a tinge of red that's been placed inside it that's where the thumb or finger rests when it holds it so it makes contact with the base rock but the coat was just such a beautiful piece of work and what's interesting is I asked my wife who's a professional artist to tell me what color it was and I always do that with the coats on every other coat she just said straight away one thing here she went for two she said, the darkest chocolate brown I've ever seen. And then she said, no, maybe there's black in that, pure black. We've never got a coat this color, this luster, or this thickness. And that coat, of course, as I've told you before, is melted silica or chert along with a resin. And you need thousands of degrees to melt that rock so you can turn it into a coat. But when you turn it into a coat, all those different angles, it's the same thickness. How do they get the thickness the same? That's technology you don't find on any open fire. Right, next up, we had this one here, which is an interesting rock. And on one side there, you'll see there's a lot of pecking going on there. But there's a couple of really straight lines. And this is really interesting. Some on the other side again. But on that side I'm looking at now, with closer looking, you'll find there are about seven, or maybe nine straight lines at different angles moving around there. What's also interesting is this coat, the colour of this coat is like a thinner and slightly paler version of the other one. And they were found together. We got them both together. This is a holding rock and you'll see that part there where there's a lot of pecking. That's where your thumb goes. You hold it like that. But the exit point's not at the front, it's at the back. There's a piece that's been knocked away just there. And that's the exit point for the energy to leave out there and a straight line running across. The coat... The straight lines on one side, there's nine on one side. That's all evidence of the more ancient form of technology where we used a lot of it and this was actually used to hold. And it's interesting, it's 3.5 centimetres across and it's 3.5 metres in height. And it's 8.9 across there. Now the last one's unusual for one thing because of those six, 
Five had obvious things, obvious ticks that made me think, yeah, fine. That's the more advanced ancient technology. I'm not touching stick and stone. Then I got one rock. Another one was sent that for a long time. I didn't approve it. I wasn't going to use it because we get hundreds of rocks that we don't accept. A, because there's nothing that's really convincing or it could be a cup, but we're not convinced or it could be natural. Or B, more importantly, it doesn't belong to, to us because it belongs to country because it's more, it's from the stick stone bone group. Now, what I'm going to show you is another one of our more dramatic rocks, which is the six and a half kilo granite one. And up the top there, I just have to put my chin on it, you'll see there's a sort of a waxy coat there that's sitting on part of it that normally went all the way across. There, you can see the top bit that normally coated it. So it was a coat of some form of lacquer. That is not chert. That's a different setup. That's not chert. That's a lacquer. Now this one, when I hold this side up, you can see the little patches of a reddish brown colour on that side, which is yellow. But on the other side, no, there's a bit of yellow in the middle there. And what we've got here, and you can see it shining, is this rock has been lacquered. And there's this part here, I think that it goes in, it sits in your hand like that. And that part is the part that rubs against your skin, and that's why it's come away. So it's a holding rock. I think it's been shaped, but I couldn't say for sure, and therefore I didn't include it. One side that's been knocked away where you rest on it, there's an impact point on that. You can see it's broken away there. There's a bulb on that side there and a bulb up here. So that's, that's recent. But the lacquering that's on that isn't recent, and that's been on there for quite some time, and that's why that one was included. So primarily, I'm doing an article about those six rocks, and if you don't want to read it, you don't have to, because I've basically told you what's in there. The other two things I want to talk about is our next online conference, where we've got Uncle Alan Parsons, and we've also got Peter, whose original name I think is Murray. Well, I'm not sure, I've got to check first. Um, and they're both painters and culture people, and they know a lot about old way stuff. And this particular presentation we're going to do is about old way. Remember, Hoppy said if you don't learn the old teachings, you will not be part of the future that's coming, the transition, the transformation of this planet that's coming at the end of this year with the third solstice. Well, we got them in because we wanted to talk about old way. And I wanted in particular to focus on two areas. One, I'm going to get Peter and Alan to talk about, which is to do with Old Way and in particular, original art. And I want to talk about the Old Way original art, not the contemporary art, which I'm not knocking in the slightest, to contemporary original art, that's very important too. But the Old Way paintings were always about dreaming stories and narratives. And then if you take someone like Clifford Possum Japuljara, when he did his paintings, his cousin would be telling the story and explaining where the different marks would go because it was locked in. Now what I'm doing with these two guys is they're going to be talking about paintings. They've done, obviously, they both do, and they're going to show you some of their work and they're going to talk about it, but they're going to talk about it at a deeper level. And I think it's really important if we do old way, we've picked on two things to do, art and the other one, which is far more dangerous, which is what we're going to do is we're going to talk about original magic. Clever fellas, Williams, the powers they had, and stories about that. It's things we've seen, things we've read, and things we've been told. And I want you to understand, as much as some people criticise us for doing this, we were going to talk about original magic last time, but we put that off. We are this time because it fits in even more with what we're talking about. Because many dreaming stories have magical components within them. That's, you've got to remember that. That's part of the deal with this. So we want to try and authenticate that part of the dreaming stories that the guys are painting. So that's what we're going to be doing. Also, um, we'll, Leah and uh, myself will have another discussion with Mesrev. And we've done a series of questions again, which I'm not going to give up now because I'm not allowed to. It's supposed to be kept quiet that only Leah sees and then she then um, talks to Mesref and nobody else knows about it, including me, until we do the answers, because I'm not supposed to know in advance. So 
we keep doing different we're actually going to do a book about this we're putting that together now as i'm speaking um where we're taking about the first 10 conversations and we're putting that up um basically as is so <clears throat> i would recommend you come and join us for that it's about the 21st um and we keep it as cheap as we possibly can so these two guys can stay alive and it's actually nearly half the price if you become a subscriber and that gives you access to all of the 20 ones we've done before plus it gets you 20% uh, off anything we're doing and that leads up to the workshop we're doing with the rocks now we've done two and the third one is completely different all the content will change except people will still sit inside the rocks again and when we do um, gloves on uh, sort of workshops inside the art studio where people act like archaeologists we'll do that again but they'll have different rocks because we've got plenty to mix around so we mix them around and that was quite interesting and it was interesting how I've done that and the pe people are picking up some of the most amazing things that are correct things that took a long time for me to find or Evan whoever's doing it but they are picking it up and it's quite interesting to see that some people have picked up on things that's taken me a year to work out in their little five minute sessions and we have a couple of those we do as well now all the other content will change okay and one thing that's going to change a lot we're going to do two sessions because what we do is we have 11 minute sessions and then we stop and we do a different 11 minute session because people come in and out for the first hour and a half because they're doing ceremony now what that means is if people just come in and out while we're talking all the time no one would really know what's going on because they're all going to miss a bit of it but if we do discrete pieces of information each time they miss out on one but they get the other seven it's the only way you can do it i know one person was said it's a bit disjointed and i said yeah but man I'm, I'm doing this for the rocks for people to get inside the rocks this is filler for that therefore the rocks come first and we have to fit around it and this time um we're in a different situation we're going to be talking about different stuff but one of the things we're going to do for two sessions is the notes of slater we have them we're the only people in this country in the world that actually have over 1000 pages of all his notes now remember he had access to murray gawalda which is the first language spoken on this planet and the first language in australia it's still known Kano can speak it and others still can they're original people of old ways that can still speak this language it's the most sacred language spoken on this planet and one of the reasons we've got this and no one else did is because others would have who would have got it would have put the whole thing out there are sacred words we will never put up and we'll tell you a lot it's got the whole language there twenty-eight thousand words he did work on that it's got everything it's got the interpretations of all the sites in australia with their proper interpretation all the ones that were done in first language he's got the language look we've got newspaper articles and we've we've got them where it's written in the newspaper in the 1930s that slater would go on to a site where the archaeologists have been there 20 years looking at it couldn't work out what it said and within five minutes he worked the whole thing out because he had the manual we've got the manual now too and we've got the manual the first language ever spoken what we're going to do at our presentation is the first time it's publicly going to be shown is with the groups we'll take selected pages and if there's any words that need to be covered i'll cover them first and we'll try and work out what that means and we'll discuss it or we'll read it and we'll have a group discussion and what comes out of that will go into the papers we write about it so we're going to be using people not using it's not quite the right word liaising with the people who join us to put up interpretations of what slater was saying now it's fascinating when you read the critiques about slater and we've read them they say number one the family said he was mad but they also say he was crazy and they also say but but he knew so much about original stuff and of course in the 1930s who did virtually no one they admit that and secondly, the critiques about him are, number one, oh, he had a group and he was the president and it wasn't Australian Archaeological Society, but there were barely 15 people in there. So it can't be that important. I want you to remember, ladies and gentlemen, until 1939, 
until 1939, there was nowhere in Australia that taught archaeology or anthropology. Elkin set up a unit, a faculty in 1939 in Sydney Uni on anthropology, and that was the first one ever done. You read stories about the people involved in these, we have, they're doctors, they're architects, they're chartered accountants, they're the sort of people doing it because there was nobody that was accredited as an archaeologist. So I would say to those people who criticise me about that, 15's a good turn up, because there virtually aren't any. And by the way, in one of the papers, we, in the newspaper we read, on one occasion Slater wrote and thanked the people working for him. He'd include an archaeologist, no, sorry, not an archaeologist, there weren't any, accountant, um, architect, doctor, and a principal of a high school, primary school. Now, ladies and gentlemen, they say he was crazy and you take no notice of his work. How come people like that did? And all these people went out the country with him in their spare time and didn't get paid for it. And everyone says he's a crazy man and don't listen to him. Well, there's some pretty uncrazy, well-educated people at the time that worked with him. And we know that. We can prove it. It's in the newspaper. But all the critiques about him, um, not one of the critics has actually read one word he wrote. We've got his letters, and only one other people's got them, and we've all, they've never asked to see them. So they haven't seen them, and nor have they seen a thousand pages of his work. And plus we have his full um, book, 620 pages, I think it's something scribes of the Stone Age, I'm not sure exactly what it's called. Um, we've got all that. And the people who criticise him have criticised him not on what he said, what his research or what he's discovered, but on his characteristics as they see them and his, his failings as they see them today when he was alive in the 1930s. That's how he's been criticised. And they've dismissed him, but no one has his work. So how can a scientist or an archaeologist or an historian be dismissed when none of it relates to his work because it's never been seen? Well, it will be now. And we believed he was the greatest archaeologist of the last century not just in Australia, but in the world, because he was the one that was talking about people coming through spaceships, they called sky heroes. And Biami came and his wife was not born from this planet, but was born up there. And his son flew off in a spaceship back up there. He was writing that in the 1930s. And it was the truth. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you get to find out about him next time round. That's what we're going to be doing. And... We will also have with us one of the two people who's speaking this time. Peter's going to be talking not um, about his paintings with us. He's just going to be talking about one thing, what the Hoppy said, old teachings. He'll do a half hour talk about old way, how we used to live and how things happened then. And that will be stunning, particularly knowing the gentleman and, how he's, and his knowledge and how he speaks. It will be a great piece of work that will give you a real good feel for what the Hoppy spoke about. So ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to come and join us. We have a major issue at the moment in getting out any information about our websites, our workshops. We've now been completely banned, so it's much harder to reach people. Um, and if you think this is worthwhile and you've been and you think others would get something out of it, please let them know because we're finding it very difficult to contact people at the moment. They've made it very difficult for us. We are in the process of trying to overcome that, but I'm not going to talk about that. Not here anyway. Not since this is how I, we got done in, but we're working on that now. But in the meantime, <coughs> we do ask the people listening if you could pass this on to others. And remember, those rocks, there are two people. One person we know why, and we mentioned before why one person didn't get a reaction. The other one, we're not sure which one it was. I have a suspicion it could have been a, a young girl that was 13, but I'm not sure about that. It may have been someone else. Um, there was one issue with the rocks this time. There was a way that one of them was placed by me that wasn't done correctly, but I fixed it straight away, and then that was fine. You've got to be very careful with that, and it's possible they were woken up by someone else that went in. That's a different story. But, ladies and gentlemen, the one thing I can tell you about these rocks is if you're ready they're willing and able. And what they will do is they'll get you ready for this change and make sure you're on the right path. All they want to do, it's their call, not mine, 
is they want to put people on the right path. So please think about joining us. Uh, it's quite a pleasant place. We live in a rainforest. It's a four-hour presentation, which is half the day, and we have a break in the middle where you'll be fed all organic stuff. Um, it's all vegan for those of us who eat meat. I'm sorry, but we don't do that here. We're not criticising you, but it just isn't made here. But it's all really good food, and we have a break for 15, 20 minutes where we break that up. And everyone who's come has enjoyed it, and everyone who's come will remember this. The only thing that's repeated is you get to sit inside there for 10 minutes again. And if you already got a response, and what I've found, and I've got to make this point, that each uh, answer, every sheet, evaluation sheet, was different. No two people had the same response. And I mentioned before, one person came with a completely broken back and was in so much pain they were ready to end their life. And they left with a completely straight back, a smile on their face, and their whole life has changed because those rocks and the skull within healed something that every chiropractor, every osteopath, and every medical uh, practitioner could not solve, and every test they gave could not help her, and the pain was getting progressively worse to the stage where she was prepared to finish her life. Not anymore. She sat between those rocks for 10 minutes. As I said, they look at each person and give them what they need first. So some people have been given what they need first. They may need more of that or they may need something else they're going to give them. But I'll guarantee you that everyone who comes, if you did it before, I bet what you write down in your responses will be different. And secondly, I bet you there will be a response. So think about it. Come and join us. And Evan's left me to try and turn this off. Evan, are you there? Oh God, this is going to be bad because the, the mouse isn't working. Oh, there it is. Hang on. God. Okay, I'll see you later. Until next time, thank you for joining.